If you have your Bibles, you can have it, open it up. And if you have a notebook, you can write. In the book of Revelation, he says to John, um, in chapter 1, he says, chapter 1, verse 11, he says, write in a book what you see. And so as you spend time, if you know, if you have a notebook or something, you can write down what God's speaking to you. And so this is the question I had. Will your flame remain? If you uh, can think of a parable, a parable where they needed their flame to remain. Do you know of a parable where you needed their, they needed their flame to remain? The ten virgins, yes. <laughs> the ten virgins, they needed their flame to remain till the end. And that's the uh, verse I was thinking of is Matthew, in Matthew 25, it talks about those ten virgins. And the ten virgins, if the Lord, if the bridegroom had come back, if the bridegroom came back right away, did you, do you know how many of the virgins would have got in? If the bridegroom came right away. All ten of them would have got in. The reason that five of them did not get in was because the bridegroom tarried. And even now, the Lord's not, the Lord is looking and he's seeing, he wants to look beneath the surface of our lives. If you were to go and look at all of those 10 virgin, virgins on that day, all of them would have looked faithful because they all had that candle, the lamp they had, and it was lit. But their faithfulness in secret was tested what was really going on underneath was tested when the Lord tarried. I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 31. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31. And it says, it's talking about Hezekiah. It says, God left Hezekiah alone only to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. So the Lord took a little bit of time. He said, you know, I'm going to leave Hezekiah to himself and I'm going to test what's in his heart. And for each one of us, it's the same test. It's not when we're all together like this it's when we're not up together and the Lord's leaving us for a little bit of time just to see what's in our heart. And as we think about the, these, these ten virgins who are waiting for their bridegroom to come, ten of, five, out of the ten, five of them were wise. They're waiting, waiting, waiting. And as I'm thinking of those there's many people that the Lord says will not be ready for his coming. He says that it'll be like the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, you know how many people were ready. There was Noah and his family was ready, but everybody else was not ready. And as you look around and you're like, Lord, am I going to be among those who are ready? I say, Lord... Yes, there's many people who may not be ready. But God, you've given me one example. You've given me an example of one person who was ready. Noah, he was ready for the Lord's coming. Or when the flood came, he was ready. He was one person who was not worried about when the flood would come. Because whenever the flood came, he was ready for that flood. And today also, if we're ready like Noah was, we have an example. You might remember in the book of Revelation, everybody's crying and crying, crying, and they're saying, nobody's there to open up the scroll. And the elders come and say to John, don't cry. There's one who's worthy to open that scroll. So in the midst of all of the people who were not worthy, there was one who was worthy. And we follow him 
we follow Jesus in the same way. In the midst of a world who was not ready for that flood, there was one example where one man was ready for that flood. And I wanted to take some time to look at this example. What was it in this man's life that made him ready in the midst of a world that was not ready for that flood? In the midst of a, a world that's not ready for the coming of the Lord, how can we see the example and follow that example to be ready for the Lord's coming? So most of us, if we go and, and we try to go and, and know of our ancestors, most of us probably, could, we might have grandparents, and some of us might have great-grandparents. It's very rare to have a great-great-grandparents that you can meet and talk to. But for one man, he could go back nine generations and meet all of his ancestors all the way. And do you know that man who could, see all, who could talk to all nine generations ahead of him? It was Noah's dad, Noah's dad Lamech, was living during the time of Adam. So Adam and, and, and Lamech, there was 56 years when they both were living together. And so even though Lamech did not see the Garden of Eden, he did not know what the Garden of Eden was like, he could talk to someone who was there in the Garden of Eden. He could talk to Adam. Now, Adam was around ni about 900 years at this time when Lamech was there. And I can see Lamech as, as a 26-year-old man going and meeting Adam and asking him, Adam, what's, what was it like inside there in the garden? And I know that Lamech was a godly man, and I'll show you why I think that. But Lamech was a man who I believe when he spoke to Adam, asked him what it was like and what he missed most from inside that garden. And I believe the answer that Adam gave him was, when I was in the garden, I got to fellowship with God. I got to walk with God. I got to spend time with God. And on the seventh day, he rested. And that was the best day I had because there was no... There was a complete rest, not only in my physical life, but also in my soul. There was a rest in my soul. And since that day of when we sinned and we were sent out of that garden, that rest was never restored. It's always been toil on the outside and on the inside. Heavy, weary, and heavy laden. That's the testimony of my life, Lamech ever since. There hasn't been any rest. And then Noah is born a little later. And Noah got to meet most of his ancestors, but he could not see Adam, Seth, or Enoch. All of them had gone by that time. But Noah had the opportunity to speak to his dad, Lamech, and ask him everything that has happened since the day of creation. And so as we look at this, I want to take a timeline from to leading up to the flood. And so we're going, we're fast forwarding in time. We're going to 600 years before the flood. So 600 years before the flood, Adam has given his testimony. You can turn with me to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Verse 17, you can read, uh, it says here, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten out of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. And so that was the curse that came to the ground. No rest anymore. He was out of the garden. And then years passed by. And I believe Lamech is pondering this and burdened with this. 
and saying, you know what, we need to be restored. That rest which Adam experienced needs to be restored. And with that cry, he's crying out. And it says, read with me in Genesis 5. Verse 29, now he called his name Noah, saying, this one will give us, give us rest from our work, from the toil of our hands, arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. And so this burden that Lamech is having, that the Lord would give rest, he's having it. And then when Noah is born, he calls his name comfort or rest, a prophetic name to say that, God is going to restore that rest which was once in the Garden of Eden. The rest that Adam experienced walking with God is going to be restored. And it's going to be found. So he named Noah prophetically that this rest is going to be coming. God's desire was not for just a physical rest from the toil of the ground. You might remember in Matthew, what was the rest that God wanted for those who are weary and heavy laden? Was it just rest for, from physical work? What do you think? It was just physical work? No, it wasn't. Read with me, Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take me, my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, for you will find rest for, for your souls. Rest for your souls. That rest for your souls that you had in the Garden of Eden, that's my longing, that your rest for your soul will be restored. And so Noah is born, and I was, I always, you know, I, I knew about Noah and his family, immediate family, but I, always, I was curious, did Noah have any other extended family? And if you read with me in Genesis, back in Genesis 5, it says, in verse 27, uh, 26, it says, Lamech, uh, Methuselah, verse 26, Methuselah became the father of Lamech, and he had other sons and daughters. That means there was other sons and daughters for other than Lamech, which would have become Noah's, do you know what those would have been for Noah? Noah's uncles and cousins and all of that. And then Lamech lived, it says in verse 28, and it says in verse 30, Lamech lived 595 years after he became the father of Noah, and he had other sons and daughters. So that would have been Noah's brothers and sisters. So Noah had a, a family of more, uh, more than his, just his immediate family. He had brothers and sisters. And if you read it, it talks about Cain. When Cain was sent out of the garden, he did not just go outside the gar garden. He decided to leave that entire area, and he went and settled east. It says that in Genesis 4, verse 16. And then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of the east of Eden. So he says, I'm not going to stay near Eden. I'm going to go east, and I'm going to settle in the land of Nod. And he says, he says, he had a son called Enoch, and he built a city and called it Enoch. He says, okay, I'm going to build a city, and I'm going to make a name for myself. I'm going to call it Enoch after my son. And so this is happening on the east of Eden. And then near where the Garden of Eden was, I believe is where... Uh, Seth and Adam and all of the, those descendants settled around there. So when we think about Cain, he was, he was all the way to the east. He was not near Noah and his family. Near Noah and his family was his brothers and sisters, his cousins, his uncles. All of those people were near him. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, those were the people that he would have been close to, his own family was who he was close to. And I'm going to fast forward another 500 years. 500 years goes by, and we're about 100 years before the flood is going to come. And after 500 years, God is looking upon this earth. He sees the sin 
probably coming from the east, from Nod and Enoch. But that's not only his concern. He's looking around all of the land, and he says every single person on this face of the planet, whether they're the descendants of Cain or the descendants of Seth, all are displeasing to me. Everywhere I look, it brings me grief to my heart. I'm sad all the time. Anytime I look around and see every person in their lives, it brings me grief. And in the midst of that, he goes and he finds one man, one person that brings joy to his heart. And you know that person. Noah. Yes, it's Noah. <laughs> and this was the testimony of his life. At the age of 500, approximately 500, this is the testimony that God gives of Noah. Read with me Genesis 6, verse 9. These are the records of the generation of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Righteous man. Blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Just like Adam had walked with God. God was fulfilling that promise that Lamech had given to his son. This is a man that will bring rest. One who's going to be like Adam who walked with God. And then it says, um, in, in chapter 7, it talks another part of the testimony of God. It says, in verse 1, Genesis 7, 1, it says, I have seen for you alone, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. Among the hundreds and thousands of people who were there, there was one person that God could say, you're the only person that brings joy to my heart. And as I think about Noah's life, what was his first 500 years look like? In the first 500 years, he did not build the ark. What did he do in the 500 years? He was not building the ark yet. Do you, know what, do you want to know what he did for the first 500 years? He walked with God, yes. He walked with God. He was righteous. He was blameless. Do you know how many commandments that Noah had? He did, did he have the Ten Commandments? No, he didn't have the Ten Commandments. Did he, say, did he have the commandment not to eat of the garden, the fruit of the... Uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil? No. So what commandment did he have? I, I think there was one commandment that he had. One small commandment, you can call it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and become united with his wife. That was his commandment. The one commandment that God had happened before Genesis chapter 5 was that one commandment. For children, you know, you have one commandment. What's your commandment? Children, be obedient to your parents in the Lord so that it may go well with you in Ephesians chapter 6. And so for each one of us and for each one of us, we have a commandment. Love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. So we have a commandment. And so... In 500 years, I see him. His parents, Lamech was a godly man, like I said. But that one commandment was to, yes, yes, Lamech, mom and dad, yes, I'll take your advice. But with respect to these things, he had a boundary around his husband, as husband and wife, they had a boundary around themselves. He said, you know what, dad, I know you're a faithful man. But God has asked me to draw a boundary around my life. It's, so in these decisions, I'm going to make it with my, between me, husband and wife, we're going to make these decisions. It's a simple command that the Lord has given me, but I'm a, I want to be faithful in the least commandment, the smallest thing, even if it's one commandment, I want to be thoroughly faithful in that. And at the age of 500, God could say, this man is a faithful man who's obeyed me, blameless. 
What would have his days looked like? In the morning, he would have got up, went, did his work. And because he was a righteous man, I believe this, just like it says of Joseph in the New Testament. Chapter, turn with me to chapter 1 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, it says, verse 19, when, when he found out that Mary was with child, this is what it says of Joseph. Matthew 1, 19. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. So as a righteous man, this is what I learned. After 500 years, when he and Mrs. Noah got into an argument, he would not pull up old stuff. He wouldn't got to go and dig up, and he, he would say, oh, you know what, I'm going to cover that up. I'm a righteous man. And that's how his righteousness was shown. It was in an ordinary manner. Yes, I forgive you completely. From my heart, I completely forgive you. I set the matter right. And when you think of a, a righteous man, what do you think of? Someone who's bringing so many people to Christ. Is that what you think of a righteous man? Noah, the righteous man, at the age of 500, was faithful in his home. Husband and wife set matters right. Cover up the past. Not bring up old things. That's how his righteousness was proved. In his workplace, if there was some disagreement on how much needed to be paid and whether he had to give more or less, I'm pretty sure he would have given, oh yeah, you want uh, it's an extra sheep? Okay, here, have the extra sheep. Completely righteous in his workplace. And in 500 years, a righteous man like Noah, I believe, would have been faithful with his, whatever he did. And I believe he was probably a person who took care of animals. And the reason I think that he took care of animals was because when God asked him to take in seven uh, of the clean animals and unclean animals and all of that and take care of them in the ark, he must have known, need to know how to take care of those animals. So I believe that he, that must have been one of his occupations. I believe he also might have been a farmer as well because... He had to feed the animals also, and also after they got off the ark, what did he do? He was, it says he was a farmer and he had a vineyard. And so I think that those were the professions that he would have had for those 500 years. Faithful, faithful, faithful. And if you're faithful with money, a little bit of money, even within a short period of time, you can pay off debt, you can do a lot of things if you're faithful with that money, saving that money and putting it, using it wisely. If a man lives for 500 years and was faithful with money for 500 years, I think Noah would have been a very, very wealthy person at the age of 500 years. He would have had a lot of animals. He would have had a lot of food. And you can see why he was this faithful man, why all of what his faithfulness up till now, what it was going to be good for. Because at the age of 500, God is telling him, I found you to be faithful. You are faithful in your workplace. You are faithful in your home life. Now I have a, a work that I have to entrust to you. I can't entrust it to anybody else. I'm going to entrust it to you. For the next so many years, I'm going to have you build an ark. And I believe... Because he was faithful for all those years, he had enough saved up, which he will need now for what, what would he need all this wealth for? To build, the, to build the ark. And Lamech, being a godly father, would have told all his brothers and sisters, cousins and all of that, he would have said, I prayed over your brother Noah and I know that he's, this work is from God. He's come to bring rest to each one of us. I want each one of you to join him in this work. And so all his brothers and cousins and all of them would have come and started building this ark with him. 
And I believe that Noah being a righteous man and a wealthy man would have been very generous. He would have given them as much as they needed for all their work in building that ark. And so all of these people are building the ark and time is going by. They can see all of this coming up. And you can see it was because he was faithful in his ordinary life. Just like us, we have the same opportunity to be faithful just like Noah was. If you're in school, you can be faithful in school. If you're at work, you can be faithful at work. You can be faithful in the home. Anything, every single thing. We all have the same opportunity to be faithful in the ordinary things of life, just like Noah was. And just like Noah got that testimony at the age of 500, Jesus also, after 30 years of being in the carpentry shop, going to the synagogue on Saturdays, helping out in the house, being, helping his brothers, at the end of that, in 30, at the age of 30, he also got a testimony. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And for me, the longing is in my heart is, Lord, I want you to be able to say that of my life. It wasn't in some great thing that Noah did that he got that testimony. It was in the simple things of life that he could do that he got that testimony. And I have the same opportunity as Noah did to receive that testimony if I long for that testimony like Noah did from God. And so he walked with God, and all of these people came, and his relatives were working on this ark. But something happened. Five years, we're going to fast forward 95 years. It's just five years before the flood is going to come. And five years before the flood comes, the godly father, Lamech, dies. He doesn't get to see the finishing of the ark. He dies. And now there's a question that comes to everybody who is working on the ark. Why are you working on this ark? Everybody had to make that decision. Why are you now working on this ark? Lamech is dead. He's no longer there. He's the one who encouraged you all to come into this work. Since he's not here anymore, what's your decision going to be? Are you still going to be building the ark? I believe that most of them Actually, all of them, unfortunately. At this time, after 95 years, they probably have got enough wealth, they didn't need to work on the ark anymore. And they said, you know what? If I asked them, they'd say, hey, are you ready for this flood that's coming? Do you believe that Noah, what Noah said is true? I believe they said, yeah. What Noah said is true, but there's so much else that we can do. Yeah, well, no, well, my dad was here, Lamech was here, we went and did the ark. But since he's gone, and we've got enough money to be well settled, we've got everything we need from Noah. <laughs> Noah doesn't realize it. We're going to go back to our life. Eating, drinking, marrying and getting marriage. Giving in marriage. And so they went on. They went on, and I believe some of them probably started building their own boat, saying, hey, we're going to prepare for the ark. We're just not going to go into this ark. We're going to build our own boat. We've been having, we have enough experience working with Noah for 95 years on how to build an ark. What they did not realize, like those five foolish virgins didn't realize, is they did not know when the flood was going to come. Noah also did not know when, know when the flood was going to come. He said, um, the Lord said that uh, I want you to build an ark. And, and seven days before the flood came, he told Noah, in seven days it's going to come. But nobody knew. These people all did not know when the flood was coming. But they felt, okay, we're going to do something to prepare for that flood. Just like those five foolish virgins did. The only thing they didn't realize was they didn't have enough time They were not ready. But the testimony of Noah's life would have rang loud and clear. All his sons and daughter-in-laws 
would have seen this man's life. The testimony of God after 500 years and working with him every day, seeing his, his, his dealings with everything. He's, they saw a godly man. And I think the test that Noah had of leaving father and mother and being united by his wife, they would have saw that. All his sons would have seen that testimony of his father in that command that God had given him. How he faithfully did not give in to the relatives and parents and other people who were trying to influence his, his, it, the decisions that they were making as a, as a family. And I believe all the daughter-in-law saw that in Noah and said, we're also going to take that same example and obey that command in Genesis 2, to leave father and mother. I believe it would have been a lot of pressure for those three daughter-in-laws because all of their families we're not in agreement with Noah. And so they would have given a lot of pressure. Hey, come on back, come on back, daughters. And they said, no. Mom and dad, I've seen something in Noah that I haven't seen anywhere else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be united with my husband, and I'm going to get into this ark. I believe God's word is true, and I see the testimony of God in, in, in my father-in-law, Noah. I see the same, same thing in the, in, in, in the book of Ruth. Turn with me to Ruth. We see this godly example in Noah, an ordinary faithful life that spoke volumes. But similar to that, Read with me in Ruth chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. So, she's, so Naomi and her husband went to Moab from Bethlehem, and they settled there because there was a famine in, in, in Israel. So they went there, and while they were in Moab, there's two, uh, so the, 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 her husband died, and then her sons, it says here in verse 4, they took for themselves Moabite women as wives, one Orpha and the other Ruth. And they lived there for how many years? Ten years. About ten years they lived. So they see Orpha and, and Ruth see their widowed mother-in-law, and in ten years they look at her life as well. Again, no miracles, no nothing. It's just ordinary life at home. But in the midst of all of Moab, they see a testimony of a life in Naomi. Not complaining. I, I assume she never had a complaint. And her faithfulness in her everyday life, in the way she cooked, the way she cleaned up, every ordinary things, these two daughter-in-law saw it. There's something different. I don't see her wasting her time on unnecessary things, getting involved in the gossip of Moab, none of that. A faithful woman walking with God. And in 10 years, there's an impression that's made in Orpah's heart and in Ruth's heart. So that now um, Naomi, it says that she wants to leave back and go back to Bethlehem. Go back to Judah. It says here, verse 9, Ruth 1, 9, it says, May the Lord grant that you might find rest, each in your mother, your, your parents' house. Go back to your parents' house. Find rest there. You've been good to me. Go back. Find rest. And listen to the reaction of the two daughter-in-laws. She kissed them, and they lifted up their voices, and wept. They cried. They're crying. Naomi, we want to stay with you. We want to go with you. Don't leave us. And they were crying and saying, you know what? We saw your life. We saw your life and we want to experience that same life with you. We're going to go with you. In, in verse 10, it says, then they said to her, no, but we will surely return with you to your people. Both Orpa and Ruth say this. We're going to come. We're going to be with you. 
11, verse 11 onwards, Ruth, Naomi is telling them, hey, I don't have a husband for you. I don't have anything to give you. There's nothing that you're going to get out of me. You're probably going to come in, and if you come and follow me, you're probably going to suffer some loss on account of me. You really shouldn't come after me. You go back. Go back. There's nothing you can get out of me. Verse 14. They lifted up their voices and wept again. They cried and said, you know what? No, no, no. We want to still go with you. We want to go with you. Naomi, we saw the way you live, the testimony of your life, and we want to follow you. And we want to know your God. And it says, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpah said, you know what? You finally convinced me, Naomi. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to Moab. Ruth says, no. I saw your life. And this, I'm, I'm clinging on to you. And it says, it says uh, Naomi's reasoning with her again and saying, you know what? Then she said, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Verse 16, and I want us to hear this word from Ruth, the testimony of Ruth. Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. And then Naomi saw, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. You might remember, I said, if God were to come, or the bridegroom were to come right away, all the virgins would have had their lamps trimmed and lighted. But because it was delayed, because the Lord was waiting to see what was on the surface versus what was underneath that surface, he waited. And like he did with Hezekiah, he stepped away. He hid himself for a little bit to see what was in their heart. And even with Orpah and Ruth, you can see, there's a stepping away to see what would be in their heart. With Orpah, finally, what was truly in her heart was Moab. But Ruth, she says, you know what? I'm going to come and suffer with you, even if there's no gain for me. But you can see that God, you know the rest of the story, what happens to Ruth? She's redeemed by Boaz, and she becomes one of the ancestors of David and also in the line of Jesus as well. And so you see this. But even though what, all of these things were happening in her heart, guess what? who was watching all of this? One, it was the Lord. But also listen to this. Ruth chapter 2, verse 10. It says, Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground in front of Boaz. Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? I'm a Moabitess. Why do you have any care for me? Boaz replied, listen to what Boaz says to her in verse 11. Ruth 2.11. Boaz replied to her, and all you have done to, for your mother-in-law, I know it was, you thought it was happening in secret, after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. You thought it was all happening in secret, nobody's watching, but I knew what was happening the decisions you were making, the choices you were making, I was watching that. And how you left your father and your mother and came to the land of your, and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not know previously. Verse 12, may the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. And for the daughters, daughter-in-laws of Noah, I believe they had the same heart that Ruth had. All three of those daughter-in-laws saw something in Noah, and they said, you know what? We're leading father and mother, and we're going to follow after him. For each one of us, we have that same choice. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 
Matthew 10, verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And so as all of these people are leaving, they had to make that choice that day. Am I doing anything for Lamech's sake or anybody else's sake? Or am I really following after because I want God? And for each one of us, brother, sister, and child, brother, sister, and child, each one of us today has to ask to answer that question for ourselves. Why are you following Christ today? Is it because somebody else asked you to, your friends, somebody else persuaded you? Are you seeking because you want to be ready when the flood comes, when the Lord comes, you want to be ready? Is that the reason? Merely because you want to be ready because when you don't want to be outside the door, you want to be inside. Is that the reason? What's the reason why you want to why, why, you, why, why, why you want to follow the Lord? It's the reason that you love God more than everything else. And so you've decided to forsake everything else. You love him more than any earthly relation. If that's the reason, you're following in the footsteps of Noah. Because you're following Jesus, not for anything he's going to give you. You're following like how they followed after Naomi. Even though Naomi could not give her, them a thing, they decided to follow Naomi. Even though there would be so much reproach in following after Noah, they decided to go. They had to make that choice, that decision. And each one of us has to make that decision. Is Jesus more to us than anything else? And the same thing goes with why are you here at the church? The same answer. You have to ask that question to you. Why are you in the church? Is it because somebody asked you to come? Is it somebody else brought you here? Or is it because you truly want? Is the Lord called you? You love God and you, you're called. He called you to this work. To be knit in love with one another. You have to make that decision. I have to make that decision before the Lord. Noah made that decision. Noah's daughter-in-laws made that decision. And each one of us has to make that decision. Lamech's other sons and daughters made that decision. They made their decision that the world, their family was more important than the Lord and the work that God had called them to build the ark. And so when the opportunity arose... They said, you know what, we're going back. And so how is our flame going to last till the end? How is it going to remain? Are we going to be faithful? Walking with the Lord just like Noah did. It was in the ordinary things of life that Noah was faithful. In his home life, in his work life, that's where his faithfulness was tested. And God asked him to get into the ark. Do you know how many days it, ra it rained? How many days did it rain when they got into the, into the ark? 40 days and 40 nights. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. But do you know when they actually came out from the, from the ark? Do you know how many days? Actually, it's not 120, but good guess. It was nearly a year that they spent in that ark, 370 days or around that, like 365, almost a year they were inside that ark. And God had told him in, Matthew, in Je sorry, Genesis 6, God told him, verse 21, as for you, take for yourself some of all the food which is edible and gather it to yourself and it shall be food for you and for them. For them means the animals. For you and them. And this is where I see the faithfulness in Noah. God said it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. But how much food did Noah t take into that ark? And remember, once the door is closed in the ark, you cannot stop and then open the door and get something. Oops, I forgot that. 
That's not possible. Once you get in there, then you have to be there till the door opens, which is a year later. So if you're there 40 days, you, God's telling you it's going to rain for 40 days, and you took food only for 40 days, what would happen? Somebody's going to be hungry for the next of the 11 months. Noah thought ahead. He knew that they're going to be there, and he prepared in that ark food for a year. You remember, there was pitch on the outside and the inside. It was very dark. There was, a, there was a three stories up. There was a window over there which was closed. You know how long the window was closed for? About nine months, the window was closed. So they were in the dark for nine months. So they needed, what did they need inside the ark if they wanted to see something? Electricity, yeah, they didn't, ele they invent didn't invent electricity yet. They needed a fire, they needed a flame, they needed a, a light that would last them, not 40 days. How long would that light have to last them? For a year, or at least nine months, that light would have to last them. And so how much of oil did Noah had to plan for? 40 days? No, he had to plan to have enough oil in his flask for a year because and so that's that's the faithful of faithfulness of a godly man and that's the example i see a man who was ready for the lord's coming had that flask and he was prepared so no matter how long the lord tarried with the flood it did not matter one man was not afraid of when the flood would come and that man was noah it could have come Year 600, 610, it didn't matter for Noah because he was always ready. Every single day he was walking with God. And the men who walk with God never need to be afraid of when the Lord's coming because they will always be ready. You might remember Enoch. He was ready when the Lord came. 30, 365 days and then he was caught up. He was walking with God and when God came, he was caught up. Noah was walking with God. When the flood came, he was ready. Paul and Peter, all of them walking with God, Jesus walking with God. When the time came, they were ready. And for each one of us, if we want to be ready when the Lord comes, we need to be walking faithfully with God every day in the ordinary things of life. Every day walking with the Lord. And after they came off from the ark, do you remember what they did? The first thing they did was build a altar and they put a sacrifice with the clean animals and they burnt it. Guess where they got that fire? I think that fire would have been that which came through the ark. They preserved that fire so that they could, that altar. And that same, it says that there was a soothing aroma that came to the Lord. And that soothing aroma that the Lord had was the testimony of Noah's life. All through his life, there was a soothing aroma that came out from his life. And that's the soothing aroma God is looking from each one of us. We can tell our children uh, anything we want. We can tell them, oh, you follow the Lord, follow the Lord. But there's an aroma that's coming from our life. It came from Noah's life, it came from Naomi's life. And automatically, those who could sense that aroma came along. You might remember, Lot also said, come along, come along. He said it to his future son-in-law, come along, God is going to destroy, there's a judgment coming. But they said, we, we don't believe you, you're probably joking. Why didn't they believe him? Why did his son-in-laws didn't believe him and Noah's daughter-in-laws believed him? Because there was an aroma of life that came from Lot that they said, you know what, this is not genuine. There's not a genuine aroma. I don't see a godly life here. And so they decided not to follow him. And so for each one of us, why? Why are we following the Lord today? Why are we a part of building his church and are we wanting to walk with him faithfully and daily 
in the ordinary things of life like Noah did. If we do, we will be ready just like he was when the Lord comes. May the Lord help us. Amen.